OK. Shall I start? Yeah. OK. So welcome, everyone. Sir, should I, like, if you don't mind, should I give the intro for you? Sure, please. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Quarks to Quasars, a series of talk on physics and astronomy presented by Horizon IT Madras. Today, we have with us our very own Professor Arun Lakshminarayan, the head of the Department of Physics at IIT Madras, uh, to give us a talk on classical and quantum chaotic systems. Professor Arul initially started out as a mechanical engineering undergrad at IIT Madras before finding his true calling in theoretical physics, in which he did his PhD at State University of New York, Stony Brook. His long and illustrious career in quantum chaos and entanglement has earned him numerous uh, recognition, such as INSA's Young Scientist Award. His primary interest continues to be complex systems, which can definitely no longer be considered to be a fringe activity. And thus, we are honored to have one of the country's best authorities on the subject here with us today. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Nidhi. A pleasure to uh, be here, and I thank uh, the organizers of the Horizon uh, event, and I mean Horizon, and uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to talk with all of you. I do occasionally uh, give uh, the usual lectures, but this is special, and especially as all of you are there. It's a pity that I'm we're not. Uh, in front in a big class and I'm sitting in a chair. But nevertheless, uh, it is a pleasure and, uh, and an honor to be here. And uh, uh, I thought of sharing with you two of my uh, special interests uh, in physics. Uh, chaos, which is really an old subject that was introduced to me by Professor V. Balakrishnan who is still very much active and who all of you would know from his uh, various uh, uh, wonderful lectures which are there on YouTube. But we had the pleasure of listening to him, of course, also and directly. And he took a course called Synergetics uh, when I was a student here between 84 and 88, in which he introduced us to the notions of chaos. And uh, since then, I have been quite enamored and trying to understand aspects of that. Um, and then my second uh, uh, in interest, which I thought I will project in this talk a little bit, is about quantum entanglement. And in fact, uh, about how these two notions of classical chaos and quantum entanglement, in a sense, interact with each other. So it's been uh, an interesting, I'm calling it an adventure, but I'm not sure that uh, it's going to read like a racy novel or something. I'm just going to talk about a few uh, points because of uh, uh, because of various limitations. Uh, I hope that uh, you, you will appreciate it as just an as something to whet your appetite, and then you can go ahead and uh, study anything that you want in this deeper. So, the roughly, this is you can see already here the uh, plan of my talk, I'll first introduce classical uh, and quantum chaos in as many, uh, in, in as few slides as possible. And then I'll talk about uh, uh, entangle, entangling uh, uh, with chaos, okay, which is the coming together of these two things. And then I will talk about absolutely maximally entangled states which is there in the title of my talk, and which is uh, which is uh, an interesting construction, which uh, 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 which uh, has uh, interactions with uh, areas of mathematics. So, um, first of all, what is chaos? So, very roughly speaking, and that's all I'm going to do in this talk. Uh, Chaos is a sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So we have some 
dynamical system in mind. It can be classical uh, systems in which you have some positions, momenta of various particles. So you have some phase space, let's say, and then you ask this, this X is representing a phase space point, it, this vector X, and you can have a trajectory which is doing this with time, just schematically, and another trajectory which is deviating away from this. And this deviation, if it is increasing exponentially with time, so this symbol here is telling you that you find the distance between these two, or uh, between these two trajectories. If this distance is increasing exponentially in time, then you call such a trajectory chaotic. And if a lot of trajectories, and probably all of the trajectories do this, then you call the whole system chaotic. And this rate of exponential divergence is called the Lyapunov exponent. And it measures the amount of chaos which is there in the system. Now, this may look like a very bizarre thing because things are just deviating from each other exponentially and they just get out, they just go off to infinity. So this is just sensitive dependence. What is important is that you also have conservation of energy and other sort of conservation laws, which lead to the phase space not being infinite, but being some compact object like a potato or something like that, some very high dimensional potato. So sensitive dependence plus this compactness of the space in which the, tra uh, the trajectories are there imply that they cannot go on diverging like this for infinity. They'll have to come back. But at any given instant of time, nearby trajectories are diverging exponentially in time. So that is the cool thing about it. It's like over a long time, yes, they have to come back. In fact, there are strong theorems which will tell you that this trajectory will come back arbitrarily close to where it began. Not exactly where it began, but arbitrarily close to where it began, and not just once, an infinite number of times. So there are these recurrences which are going on. And so the dynamics is really very complex, rather than what we study in, uh, uh, in, in mechanics courses as some closed orbits, and then you have some harmonic oscillator or simple pendulum, and things are just going on and on. Uh, actually, it's a much more interesting and complex story. Okay, and just I'm just I'm not talking about very weird systems. You'll see what kind of systems I'm talking about. Uh, so this is called chaos or deterministic randomness. It's called deterministic randomness because there's no external noise. No one is tossing a coin or anything like that. However, it looks random to us, and it can pass many tests of randomness. Okay, so. Uh, and what kind of systems are these? Very surprisingly, almost all systems which are larger than one degree of freedom. You know what a degree of freedom is? Effectively, it's just how many parameters you need to specify the configuration of a system. For example, a simple pendulum has just one, you just need one angle. But if you have a pendulum attached to another, there's a famous example of a chaotic system already. You just have a double pendulum. You have two degrees of freedom, you have two angles. Uh, and uh, the um, any system with more than one degree of freedom is likely to be chaotic. Of course, there are systems with more than one degree of freedom which are not chaotic, but they are very special. And in fact, you have to construct them, you have to look for them. Uh, here is an animation of that for a triple pendulum. So I took, let me, oh, let me actually say something before I turn this on. Here is a simulation of a triple pendulum, which means that you have one link here, another link here, another link here, and each of these pendulums can rotate by 360 degrees around this. Okay, and it's frictionless. And, uh, uh, even double pendulum shows chaos, but this is a cool simulation with a triple pendulum. So there are three degrees of freedom. There are three angles in this. And what you're seeing is actually 40 of them with almost the same initial condition. So I'm just start kicking off proceedings from here. And although it looks like one, there are really 40 of them here. And you will see all of them now. They're all separating out 
So actually, when you are see, when you are seeing them like this, they are not going together. They are already exponentially separating. Only you are not seeing that because it's too small for our eye to discern. But the exponential growth is actually a very, uh, very fast growth. So it will, uh, however small your epsilon is, it can be like ten power minus twenty in a very small time step, very small time because it's it's be log of that this will uh, uh, separate out into that. So this is a visualization of what's happening in a chaotic system. This is completely, you know, each of the pendulums, by the way, is not interacting with the other. It's just that it's showing how sensitive the dependence is. If you knew the initial conditions of the pendulum to be what it is, and then you were to ask me, okay, after three seconds, tell me where it is. I'm not, I'm not three seconds. Three seconds is fine, but not 10 seconds, okay? And uh, so, uh, so this is a hallmark of this. And in fact, most of uh, phenomena are not predictable, although we seem to uh, claim that we know everything about uh, even classical physics. I'm not talking about quantum and so on. For example, the weather, we can't predict micro weather after five days. It re it's related to the... Um, kind of fluid dynamics models that people use to make predictions. The solar system is a many-body chaotic system. So the stability of the solar system is a fascinating story. And about 20, 30 years ago, uh, there has been very extensive simulations on supercomputers and so on. And uh, it has come to the conclusion that actually the solar system is chaotic. There are many interesting problems just about the solar system itself. First of all, the three-body problem, if you just have three gravitating bodies, just Newton's laws is a chaotic system. So it's actually a surprise that we have so many objects in the solar system and we are not, we are in such a stable situation that we think we are, Earth is going to be rotating around the sun, everything is fine forever and ever. Um, actually, the solar system is, has ejected out a lot of chaotic partners. What remains are islands of stability, more or less. But still, they're not islands of infinite uh, stability. Solar system is chaotic with very small Lyapunov exponents. Pluto, which has been degraded from a planet, as you know, is got the largest Lyapunov exponent. And the inverse of the Lyapunov exponent, as you can see, has a units of time, which is about 20 million years for Pluto at this point. So it's order of million years. So in the scheme of things, Pluto will leave us uh, after a the, this many number of years. Okay, uh, now that's a simple mechanical system. Are there any other simple mechanical systems? There are many. Here, I, this is just a free particle. One wouldn't think that a free particle uh, can be chaotic, but it can be depending on boundary conditions. So here we have a ball which is bouncing inside a uh, cavity or a room which is shaped like a stadium. It's not a very weird shape. Okay, there are two semicircles attached to these straight line segments. That's it. And this ball will go hit this and reflect peculiarly. Angle of incidence equals angular reflection. That's the only rule you need to know. The speed is not changing, only the uh, velocity is changing at the points of reflection. So now again, we'll run a bunch of initial conditions from one point, approximately one point. Uh, I mean, one point, but slightly different velocities. And then see what's happening. It's reflected now. You can already see that the many trajectories have got defocused. And uh, uh, and uh, this would be an example of both. I mean, it's a, it's a chaotic, ergodic, mixing, all kinds of words you can use. So if you take any one of them, it will come arbitrarily close to any of these points in the uh, billiard table. So this is another example of this. I found this in this uh, website, Julia Dynamics, which is Julia is a language, uh, especially for um, applied mathematics and physics. So um, he, he, they have this entire thing for Julia Dynamics, which I encourage you to take a look.
Okay, now that's for classical mechanics. I'm now going to go into quantum. Now, for those of you who are not physics majors or those who have not done a course in quantum mechanics, this is my one slide introduction to it. States in classical mechanics are points and phase space, whereas in quantum mechanics, they are more abstract objects and they are vectors in some vector space. And what is cool about this, very different from states in that we are used to, in like what I just now showed, discussed in states and phase space, what I showed were really pictures in real space, but the dynamics is happening in this higher dimensional phase space. Coming to quantum mechanics, states are these uh, vectors and vector space, and they can be superposed. So it's like an electric field or something like that, where we superpose electric fields and get an electric field in space. Here we can superpose very different states and get physical, physically different states uh, and allowed states. So, uh, for example, there and here, spatial locations, it doesn't make sense to add them in a classical sense. But the state there plus here does make sense in quantum mechanics. So these kind of superpositions, non-classical superpositions, on plus off, make sense in quantum mechanics and not just plus, you can put weights on these things and be very fancy about it. So there is superposition which is not there in classical mechanics. And also positions and momentum are observables, you can measure them. And they are just normal numbers in classical mechanics. Whereas in quantum mechanics, they are operators, you must think matrices, okay? They are like matrices, they don't commute. And X into P is not P into X. A consequence of this is in fact the uncertainty principle, which we study as sort of a basic thing in quantum mechanics. But it's actually resulting from these observables not commuting with each other. And what about dynamics? What happens to Newton's or Hamilton's equations or Lagrange equation? They're replaced by Schrodinger's wave equation. I'm not going to go into that, but you should know that there exists an equivalent of, of these things called the Schrodinger equation, which is a linear equation for the state. So here, when I say a wave equation, it's really referring to the state, okay? So it's an evolution of quantum state. And there is another very interesting difference between classical and quantum mechanics is that the measurement of an outcome, uh, a measurement leads to random outcomes from a same state. From an identically prepared state, you make identical measurements, you will get different outcomes, different random outcomes. This was really formulated first by Jordan, but it's known as a Bond rule. And uh, it is the basic non-determinism of quantum mechanics. You see, classical mechanics is completely deterministic, although it can be chaotic like this. It can appear to be random, but if you if you push me and, and you tell me, well, you need to predict it, if you give me more and more accurate initial conditions, we can go ahead and predict it for longer and longer times. But you need to give me absurdly, absurdly accurate initial conditions if the system is chaotic, if you need me to go for long times. But in principle, it's possible, so it's deterministic. In quantum mechanics, even in principle, it's not possible. And there is this thing that measurements leads to random outcomes. So there is actually an intrinsic randomness in quantum mechanics. And there is a very important uh, aspect of quantum mechanics, which Schrodinger, along with uh, uh, in around 1935, he, he, he said it is the most important difference between classical and quantum mechanics, and that's known as entanglement. And this originated from the arguments of Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen in the famous EPR. There is a famous EPR paper, it's called EPR. I'm not going to go into that. But they argued that there is something which is wrong about quantum mechanics. It's not complete, is what they said because of something which today we call entanglement and which was immediately seen by Schrodinger uh, in, in all its uh, uh, subtlety. 
which is very remarkable. And uh, so it can be simply put at this stage as the whole is more than the sum of its parts. So let me just expand on that for a minute. Um, if, for example, let's again go back to my, I don't know, maybe this pendulum. There are these three pendula. There are these angles, three angles, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3. And angular velocity is theta 1 dot, theta 2 dot, and theta 3 dot. Okay. So it's actually a six-dimensional phase space. There are three positions, three velocities. Now, if you give me the state of this pendulum, these three pendulums, you're giving me a point in the six-dimensional space. Obviously, from that, I can infer what is the state of this pendulum, this first pendulum. I can infer the state of the second. I can infer the state of the third. So if you give me the parts, I can get the whole. If you give me the whole, I can get the parts. It seems pretty obvious. But quantum mechanics is not like that. It says that you can give me the state of all these three together. I still will not be able to tell you what is the state of an individual pendulum here. If it is typically a typical state, which is called an entangled state. So that is the whole. To describe the whole, you can't do it by just giving the state of this, state of that, state of that. No. You have to give the state of the whole. So in a sense, this is, this by the way, I talked about a course called synergetics. The synergy is actually, it means that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. You can read, there is some, there's some philosophy and so on behind it, but for us, it's a definite statement in physics. Okay, so now what happens to all this chaos, you know, this kind of chaos, which is there here, and which is there in the pendulum. What happens to it when we are doing quantum mechanics? It looks like quantum mechanics is extremely different. There is superposition, there is this uncertainty principle, the equation itself has changed. Then there is measurement, non-determinism, there is entanglement. It looks like, well, we have to say goodbye to Newton and his friends. But you have to ask the question, that classical mechanics is a perfectly great theory. That's what we are going to use when we are sending out a satellite. We are not going to do quantum mechanics. Thank God for that, right? I mean, it's not going to be easy. Uh, so there is an emergence of the classical world from the quantum. How this happens is another very interesting topic, which is even today under discussion. The emergence of a classical reality from a quantum one. But again, I want to be very simple. I want to ask, let me take some of these simple systems which are looking chaotic, classically are chaotic. Let me quantize it and ask what happens. So this is the subject of quantum chaos. It had its beginnings around 1979. It is even now a very active uh, theory, a uh, very active subject, uh, both experiments and theory at this point. And it has diversified itself into almost all areas of physics. What are the problems? First of all, there's no phase space because position and momentum do not commute. As you know, this commutator is in fact I h bar. So a very mysterious relationship there. You have the square root of minus one and this Planck constant divided by two pi coming in. This means that there is an uncertainty relation, which means that you can't specify position and momentum to infinite accuracy, but you have some accuracy which is controlled by h bar in phase space. So you can't have a point in phase space, but you should have a region in phase space, roughly speaking, which is of the order of H bar. That's what quantum mechanics is doing, a kind of a coarse graining at the scale of H bar. So here is one of the simple questions first. How does classical chaos impact quantum spectra and time evolution? By the way, questions can be simple. The answer is not. Uh, Answers need not be. So here is a beautiful article which has nothing to do with quantum or chaos, but nevertheless, I'm putting it up here for you uh, to read. Um, I'm suggesting it. It's just one of the many, many papers which are interesting. But I put it here for a very specific reason. Uh, it talks about prime numbers and Brownian motion. By the way, Brownian motion is stochastic or random motion, right? Which is uh, statistical 
uh, things. But for us, or like for me, I would like to see what is the origin of randomness everywhere. Prime numbers, they are the perfect numbers which are constructing all of integers and all of, uh, all, all of the numbers. They are the atoms of numbers. But actually, if you look at prime numbers, there's no formula for it yet. It looks pretty chaotic and random. So there is a lot of interaction between number theory and randomness and chaos. But that's not why I'm putting up this. I'm putting this up because there is a, uh, there is a quote in that, which I like. Let me read it out. Uh, this is uh, where the, the, the authority of William Feller, who used to tell us, his students, that the best in mathematics as in art, letters, and all else, that the best consists of the general embodied in concrete. The best consists of the general embodied in the concrete. Although at first I thought that was simply an anti-military sentiment, I did eventually understand it as the intellectual aesthetic principle he intended and have tried ever since to keep it at the front of my mind. So what I want to say here is that you may ask very general questions, but go to a very specific example like that pendulum, uh, like the pendulum or the uh, stadium billiard. By the way, those things are called billiards in general, and they are very interesting uh, mathematical uh, objects. Uh, so the general embodied in the concrete, this is what we need to do. Uh, so towards that end, what I'm going to do is take a simple pendulum and start kicking it around like it's a football. So it's still there at one point, Okay, it's still suspended from one point, but every periodically in time, nothing random about it, periodically, let's say every second, I'm going to kick it. So the kicking strength is this K, which I've put here, and, uh, and the kicking depends on where the pendulum is in a very particular way. In fact, it has simply to do with the gravitational uh, field there. So let's just call it cos theta. Okay, so k times cos theta. That is the impulse which I'm giving this. So this is a kicked pendulum. We can look at it both as a classical system and quantum. We can quantize this in the usual way we study quantum harmonic oscillator. We don't study, even if you have done a course in uh, quantum mechanics, probably you haven't done the quantum pendulum, but uh, but uh, but you can, and uh, here this is also kicked in time. So it's a, it's what is called today. There is a fancy term for it. People say they are doing Floquet systems, F L O Q U E T, which is just meaning periodic in time impulses or forcing in general. So okay, so let's not force it at all. Then what happens? So what I'm plotting here is momentum versus position. So this is just angle because it's a pendulum. So there's only one angle. It's just one pendulum, not three. So it's just one pendulum and the angle of momentum, nothing happens to it because there is no forcing of any kind. Okay. So in fact, what you're going to see is a bunch of initial conditions, not one, the square set of initial conditions, which are moving in time, but since it is kicked at, let's say, one second, I'm also going to look at it position and velocity or momentum only every one second. So that's why you're seeing this as a uh, as a uh, impulsive thing or a stroboscopic plot, okay? So you see, nothing happens to the momentum. Momentum is not changing. Position, it will spread out along the circle okay? because there are different moment, there are different velocities so it like a racers on a or runners on a track, the slow ones will fall behind, the fast ones will go, then they will catch up with the slow ones and so on. So that's all that's happening here. Very simple. There is no, uh, uh, there's no chaos. Uh, it's just free particle on a ring. Okay, so it's just rotating like uniform motion. Same thing quantum mechanics. But what do I mean by same thing? Because there is, I said, I told you there is no position and momentum. So what I'm visualizing here is a state, a quantum state, which you should think of 
as being localized in position momentum. So this is what is called a coherent state in case you have heard of the term, which is a minimum uncertainty state. So it is as close to a point in phase space as you can get. But you see the difference between quantum and classical is very remarkable if you look at these pictures. Let's start over again and then go. Okay, so here there's just one blob. It's expanding and then there is interference effects which are happening here. You can see these things and it is reforming so that the pendulum is in so many different positions possible. You see, wherever there is a peak, it's possible. So this is what I meant by here plus there. It's actually creating what are called fancily cat states. And this is just free motion. <laughs> there's no chaos, there's nothing, okay? And this is happening because of superposition. So even this is actually very interesting uh, physics. It has what are called fractional revivals, okay? Uh, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but uh, there is quantum classical correspondence for a long time. So this, by the way, my uh, PhD advisor was Nandor Balash, late Nandor Balash, he's no more. Michael Berry is a well-known physicist, uh, is known most for his phase, which means that he has invented a phase called, not invented, discovered a phase of great importance in quantum mechanics called the Berry phase. Okay, so they said that the, they found long ago that the time scale at which this correspondence fails is one over square root of h bar, where this h is some scaled Planck constant. Don't think about it as the Planck constant, which you know, but that Planck constant divided by some action scale. Okay. Now, that's fine. What happens if there's chaos? We do the same exercise now, but we start kicking it wildly. So huge kicks. Classically, what happens? You have that square. After a very short time, it has expanded and you're seeing that completely everywhere. So this is, it is spread like a gas into this entire thing. But you see, it's not a gas. It doesn't have an Avogadro number of particles. It's just a one degree of freedom system, but there are many initial conditions and they are spreading out into this beautiful way and they are uniformly spreading out. Okay, so... This state, though, looks uniform and there is some statistical uh, connections to this. What happens to the quantum? Let's, again, wait for it to come back. So there is an initial coherent state which will be well localized in phase space. Position, momentum, well known. But then it starts to... Uh, this, this interference patterns now looks uh, pretty unpredictable and uh, there are very interesting and I should say largely uh, this is only partially understood even today although this has been studied as you can say you can see uh, for a very long time so actually I think I don't see the initial uh, ah there it is I can't seem to control it there is that single blob at the center which is very quickly expanding out into this so the delocalization of this is what is giving rise to this? And in fact, e, there are many body systems. There are it's a you can you can think about it as also a leading to the physics of uh, delocalization. You know, when metals become from insulators to um, uh, conductors, you have such transitions which are happening also. Okay, so uh, and the time of correspondence is much smaller than when there is no chaos. So it's a log of one over h. So this is the correspondence time. And therefore, you see, if there is chaos, it tells you that quantum effects come on very fast. This is rather interesting. And I want to just stress that based on what we have been doing so far or been talking about, that you can ask, okay, here there is a quantum, there is a classical, if it is chaotic, when will this correspondence between, initially there is some correspondence. If you take something which is well localized in position, it looks like maybe a classical evolution for some time. That time, by the way, is called an Ehrenfest time. And uh, uh, the interesting thing is that that Ehrenfest time is extremely short for chaotic systems. So in fact, there's a very provocative question that was asked. 
there are some moons which of, of, of planets, maybe it was Jupiter, which are known to tumble chaotically. Okay, so there has been there has been uh, studies over long enough time scales that uh, you can find out what its Lyapunov exponent is, and so there is this object which is tumbling chaotically. So it has a Lyapunov exponent. You can find out what is Ehrenfest time for that, and if quantum mechanics has to work for all objects, including that moon of Jupiter, it should have now been showing superposition effects quantum effects. Why is why are we not seeing that? Okay, now there are, could be many answers to that, but it's an interesting question which I'm not going to go into. But I'm just telling you one of the uh, consequences of such short times in chaotic systems. Okay, so uh, let me go ahead. So there are many, many aspects of quantum chaos, which I'm not going to go into. There is universality. Universality means that many different systems like this pendulum, uh, maybe a hydrogen atom in a strong magnetic field or a strong electric field, which is also chaotic, by the way, is or a helium atom, which is then already chaotic. It's excited states and so on. Universality. They show certain statistical properties which are very similar, like the spacing between the energy levels and so on. So this is described by the statistical theory of random matrices. And this was developed by uh, the uh, Indian physicist uh, Madan Lal Mehta in the 50s, uh, Freeman, Dyson and Vigna. But it's now a very flourishing subject in mathematical physics. There's a very interesting uh, things happening in the theory of that. I'm not going to go into that, but it's something which I could spend hours talking about. Semi-classical theory, periodic orbits and trace formulas. Again, its interactions with uh, physics and mathematics is very deep and there are associated names of Gutzpiller and Berry. What are periodic orbits got to do with chaos? So I want to emphasize that this kind of thing which looks completely chaotic here, You may think that there are no periodic orbits, but actually there are not only are there periodic orbits, they are there everywhere and almost everywhere and they are dense. That's what they are, I mean. That is, if you give me any point, I can find arbitrarily close to that a periodic orbit. Only thing that periodic orbit is also unstable. So you will you will never find it by normal search methods. Okay, so in fact, there is that exponentially large number of periodic orbits and uh, they are used in semi-classical theories of quantum chaos. As I said, many applications, it really began with um, uh, nuclear physics and then there's a lot of applications to atomic systems because that's where quantum mechanics is useful uh, or immediately applicable to quantum computers and uh, more recently to quantum field theory and quantum gravity. Just to emphasize the recentness of this, I'm just quoting here that the black holes are the best possible scramblers of information. So this is a quantum theory of black holes. And there is a claim that these are, in a sense, the most chaotic objects, in a sense. Okay, So there is still no full theory of quantum gravity as you know it. But what I want to emphasize is that it's a very alive subject which is going into very different uh, areas, including string theory. There are many, many open problems, okay? We understand only a few particle systems. There are many complications with multi-particle systems. One of the complications is entanglement, which I will talk about. Transition to chaos is open problems in both classical chaos and quantum chaos. Very simple to state, uh, problems with just three degrees of freedom are open even today. So classical mechanics is far from a dead subject. And I talked about prime numbers and number theory. And one of the mysterious functions connected to prime numbers is the Riemann zeta function. The zeros of the Riemann zeta function are like the eigenvalues of a quantum chaotic system. So this like will be uh, another lecture. Um, but for those of you who know the Riemann zeta function, very simple to define. 
is just 1 plus 1 over 2 power s plus 1 over 3 power s, etc., where s is a complex number. And uh, it can be analytically continued to the whole complex plane. It's called the Riemann zeta function. And there was a conjecture of Riemann that the zeros of this lie on the imaginary, uh, on, a, on a vertical line in which the real part is half. And uh, this remains a conjecture. If you prove it, you're instantly famous. There is, uh, and probably rich, there is, a mil it's, I think, a millennial problem or something of that kind. Uh, and it has very interesting connections to precisely what I'm talking about. And many people like Michael Berry have tried to prove this, but so far, this has been unsuccessful. Okay, uh, now I'm going to go into a second part of my talk. As you can see, I'm going, uh, as usual, slow. Um, but uh, let me now come to another aspect of quantum mechanics, which is entanglement. And here I've taken this uh, uh, cartoon from a paper by... Um, uh, 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 by Bertelmann. Bertelmann was a colleague of a person called John Bell in uh, CERN in the 1970s and 1980s, I guess. And uh, uh, they were colleagues. But he didn't know that John Bell had made him famous uh, by writing a paper and putting a cartoon of him in that. So just read this. My socks were always of two different colors. As John Bell observed in this cartoon accompanying his paper, Bertelmann's socks are the nature of reality. The paper which addressed the difference between quantum and classical correlations was based on a colloquium, conceptual implications of quantum mechanics. So Bertelmann apparently uh, had a habit of wearing socks of different colors. So... Uh, John Bell, who was one of the founders of understanding entanglement in a deep way, um, after the seminal works of Schrodinger and uh, uh, Einstein and others. So he said, well, entangled particles are somewhat like these socks, in the sense that if you observe Bertelmann's socks, let's say you observe that one of them is pink, you know that the other one is not pink. So without any observation, you have information because you know about Bertelmann. So, uh, but this looks actually quite a trivial statement. Uh, but there is much more to it uh, than, than this if there is really entanglement of these socks. So let me try to talk about that. Here, let's say that we have a classical pair of socks of Bertelmann's, let's say, or anybody else's of two very different colors. And uh, let's say that uh, you send one of these socks, but you don't know which one. You close your eyes or you put them in a box. No, you don't know which one, okay? You put each one of them in a box blind, and then you give it to somebody who doesn't know which sock is in which box. And you send this box to the far left and the other box to the far right. Okay, very, very far away. One could be in Andromeda and the other Earth. Now, if a person opens this box and sees a green sock, they know that the one which is far away is an yellow sock. Okay, so far so good. But if they find that it's an yellow sock, then they know that the other one is green. Very good. This is not entanglement. This is actually an unentangled classical pair of socks, which is perfectly well within our intuition. Okay. What is not within our intuition is something like this, which is a superposition of these two states, wherein the different boxes contain different socks and uh, could contain different socks, but it's a superposition of these two. In this case, if you pack off one of them, you don't know what it is, and you pack off the other to the other end of the universe, and you make a measurement of one of them and you get green, you still know that the other one is yellow. But here is where the randomness of measurement of in quantum mechanics comes in. It says that you have prepared identical states, 
You've prepared identical states. Or actually, let us just imagine that you have closed the box, which you have found to be green. You have closed it and you have reset the conditions to the condition before you have opened it. Okay, so it is entangled with the distant socks. You have somehow done that. You have reset the condition. You open it again. You won't find that it is green. You may find that it is yellow. It's the identical conditions, identical stain, but you have now got an yellow sock. You still know that the other sock there is green. So this randomness is a very crucial aspect of quantum mechanics, which is not there in the classical state, such as what we found there. And therefore, if you continue to make such measurements or openings of these boxes, you will find a random set of green and yellow, which will be perfectly correlated with a very far away uh, thing. So uh, what does this imply? So this is telling you that, uh, look, it seems to be influencing the sock, which is very far away. You have opened it. You don't really know what is there in this, but you opened it and the state has, so to speak, collapsed to this and you immediately know what is there in, in that uh, thing far away. So uh, how does this sock know that what you have found there is green, so to speak? Okay. So this is at the heart of entanglement of, of this and that's why it's very different from a classical pair of socks. Now, if you go beyond socks, socks are difficult to see quantum effects and entangle them. What one usually entangles are, uh, uh, are other uh, degrees of uh, freedom. So here, light has been used, polarization of light, up, down, plus or minus, down, up. There are two photons from the source. One is going to Alice, other goes to Bob. And then Alice is doing measurements on her thing. Bob is doing measurements of polarization on, on that. The polarizer can be inclined in different ways. And that inclination is given by A or B. Okay. And then they are getting up or down as the polarization states, depending on the polarizer's measurement here and there. So what John Bell did was to derive a very famous inequality in the 1960s, which says that if the state is entangled like this, it will violate his inequality. So if quantum mechanics is true and you can have such bizarre superpositions, then it will violate his inequality. And uh, so this was actually going beyond Einstein and others in saying that here you do an experiment, you do these measurements, and you find these expectation values or correlations. And if it is larger than something, then it is impossible, then it is it, it has to be having these kind of entanglement, has to be a reality. And in fact, this, these experiments were done in the 80s by Alain Aspe, and they continue to be done even uh, ever increasingly uh, so. And uh, it, it has all states such as these have all violated Bell's inequality, showing the reality of such entangled states. I should also say another very important aspect of these measurements. You may think that you have a box. When you open it, you see a green socks. So you would be, we would all be pardoned to think that there was a green socks before you opened this box. Quantum mechanics does not agree with that. The, the state on a measurement is not revealing a pre-existing state. In a sense, the measurement is making that state. So you should think, you cannot think about this sock in isolation to the other sock. It is actually, they may be very far apart, but as long as they are entangled, they are one entity. And measurement does not reveal pre-existing states, but it is creating these states randomly. So these are, I'm not, this is, these are not statements of philosophy. These are tested in uh, experiments in the recent past in about, 20 years or so, there have been very sophisticated experiments which have tested this and continue to be done. So those states in which this sock is, let's say, green and uh, yellow, 
plus yellow and green is maximally violates this bell inequality it maximally violates bell inequality so they are special states and they are called maximally entangled states maximally entangled states of well we can't say of socks so here i have taken a sock which is green and yellow so every sock then here can have only two states green or yellow so these are called two level atoms you can think about this polarization as exactly that is up or down polarization uh, uh let's say degrees of freedom the I mean, polarization has two independent degrees of freedom let's call it up and down or something like that left or right doesn't matter so um um you have these uh, uh superpositions need not be equal you can put some alpha and beta there as some weights so that alpha square plus beta square equals 1 So if beta is zero or alpha is zero, they are not entangled. But if alpha equals beta, it's maximally entangled. If alpha is zero or beta is zero, it will not violate Bell's inequality. But if alpha is beta equal to beta, then it will violate it maximally and be a genuinely quantum state. Okay, I don't have much time, so let me just go ahead and say that there are very interesting states. Now, suppose you consider three socks. instead of two you can get ambitious and create such entangled states of these three socks it's called a ghz state it's a maximally entangled state just as that state of uh, two um, socks okay but the state looks simple when i write it down but in fact it is a very complex object to think about it in terms of entanglement if you take three rings such that no two of them are linked to each other but all three are linked together that's an example of something called a boromian rings there are boromian triangles near my house in a temple so you can have these cool configurations where no two are linked but all three together the ghz state is analogous to that in the sense that no two socks are entangled with each other but all three are so there's this thing called multipartite entanglement so to understand entanglement in these systems is very uh difficult i mean is is interesting and you may think that i can go on adding these socks and they'll be maximally entangled not so so if you have four socks and you do this it's not maximally entangled in fact there cannot be any maximally entangled state of a two level system or a qubit okay so uh what is all this stuff got to do with chaos so initially i talked about chaos a bit about quantum chaos and then i talked about entanglement gave you some idea about it being a quantum uh, a quantity and not just an quantum interesting quantity which is looking at foundations since about 20 years it's been used ex extensively in quantum information theory like for example teleportation dense coding there are various uh, various algorithms quantum key distribution quantum cryptography things where quantum technologies come in entanglement can play a very important role is known to play a very important role so we would like to create such maximally entangled states maybe and then make use of them in various things how do you make them well i'm not going to i don't it's an ongoing thing but since we know about chaos let's use chaos so let's see if suppose there are two systems which are individually chaotic and you connect them together you couple them together there is some interaction between them there will then be entanglement how large is that entanglement it turns out that actually chaos creates highly entangled random states so random states you can ignore the term here so nearly maximally entangled states okay so here is some old work of mine with an ex uh, student who's now a faculty somewhere so this you can think about as entanglement and a quantity measuring entanglement as a function of some chaos parameter let's say some entry. and you can see that it's increasing with chaos and then it's saturating because of a finite dimensionality of the uh quantum spaces but as the dimensionality of the spaces increases the amount of entanglement increases or this is entanglement versus time here and you can see that it's like an entropy it grows with time and then it saturates at this value which is nearly the maximum it's not the maximum 
nearly the maximum. So what I want to uh, probably say as a carry uh, home thing is that quantum chaos can create highly entangled states, but not maximally entangled states. They can create nearly maximally entangled states. This has been seen in experiments, electron spin experiments in ultra cold atoms, the butterfly effect, which is a kind of a, uh, a kind of a, a popular term for chaos gets entangled, quantum signatures of chaos in a kick top and so on. So people saw this uh, effects, uh, have been seeing this in experiments, this is 2009. There's a more recent experiment in which there are three two-level systems and you can see some here, some classical phase space, you can see some non-chaotic and chaotic orbits. And then you can start off some states in the chaotic and ask how entangled it is. And you can see that this blue has more entanglement. This picture is just showing entanglement in these states. So chaos is creating more entanglement than if there's no chaos. Okay, so that is the story as far as that is concerned. Uh, how do you create maximally entangled states? Okay, uh, this is something which is an, um, I thought I will share with you a recent work which is constructing these absolutely maximally entangled states, but I have maybe 10 minutes more if I can. Nidhi, uh, should I? Should I go yes, ahead for? Yes, sir. You can take 10, 15 more minutes. Okay, thanks. Very good. So then I'll be more relaxed and, uh, 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 and, and go through this. So what we want to do, we want to, so what, what, what I said was that chaos can be used to dynamically create highly entangled states. And how you can have chaos is a different story, but as I told you, a lot of systems are chaotic. This is actually an example of a kick top. I showed you a kick pendulum. So this is not very different from that. And this is experimentally realized. Uh, however, we want to create not just any entangled state, we want to create absolutely maximally entangled states. Now that's difficult probably to generate dynamically, uh, but we try to first of all see whether we can even write down mathematically what these states are. So here are uh, some, again, let me uh, just show you some uh, quantum uh, mechanics for those of you who know this. Again, here is a state, quantum state psi. Now D is the dimensionality of each of the systems that are getting entangled. So you can think about it as a D level atom. Okay, an atom with only D levels. So it belongs to this. If there are two atoms A and B, then they can get entangled. But if suppose they are, when is the such a state entangled? If it cannot be written as a state of A into a state of B, this is actually a tensor product of that. And how does one detect whether this is entangled or not is to do something called a trace, which is basically saying that you do a sum over all states in the subsystem B of this uh, state and you get a state of subsystem A. So this is the state which would be accessible to an experimentalist who does not have any access to system B. A system B is an andromeda. We have only system A. System A does not see the psi AB. This is the subsystem that I talked about when I said the whole is larger than the parts. This is the part. Rho A is the part. Psi AB is the whole. Okay, now, when is this maximally entangled? This is maximally entangled if this state of this uh, reduced density matrix is actually maximally mixed. So this is like white noise, okay? So all states are equally possible. So that's what this is telling you, that is this identity. It's proportional to the D-dimensional identity. So mathematically, we can express a maximally entangled state as a superposition, as I said, superpositions are important, of unentangled states with coefficients here, uij. And this uij, if it is an unitary operator, 
then it will be a maximally entangled state. So take it from me that this is the case because you can find the reduced density matrix from this. The fact that this is a unitary operator will force this to be maximally mixed. Okay. So an unitary operator, recall, is an operator such that that multiplied by its complex conjugate transpose is equal to identity. Okay. Uh, in quantum mechanics, all time evolutions are unitary operators, e to the i h t or minus i h t. Okay, very good. So this is how you create, take two particles and you make them maximally entangled. You can use a single unitary operator to do that. But what about many systems? We are interested in capital N of them. So if you have capital N of them, we can define what is called an absolutely maximally entangled state. If we take any half of it, let's say that we have these eight particles, we bunch half of four of them into a subsystem which we call A, and then we require that that be maximally entangled with this B. So if you had those Bell inequalities I talked about, it will maximize some inequalities, or all the inequalities, all the Bell inequalities. So it will be maximally uh, non-local, okay? But then you can do the split in any way you want. You can split it into this four versus that four. For all of them, if they are maximally entangled, then you call this absolutely maximally entangled states. Okay, so that's what this is telling you. The set has to be, I did for any, this, this is the subset S which you're tracing out. Uh, so this is the, and there are many applications here of this, which I will not go into. So now let's do some uh, sort of a little bit of a magic here. Okay. Um, let's, let's forget about quantum mechanics or anything like that and start playing cards because we are bored with quantum mechanics, especially entanglement and chaos. And uh, we say, well, let's take cards, but then we're not really speaking playing cards, but let's take just A's, King, and well, here this is a problem, I should have changed this, but let's say Queen, okay, when there's D, you read that as Queen, uh, A's, King, and Queen, okay, um, and uh, uh, Diamond, Spade, and Clover, okay, Those, so these are the three types of the cards. Now, there are nine possibilities of combinations of ace, king, and queen, and diamond, clover, and club, or spades, right? There are nine possibilities. Can you arrange the nine possibilities in a three by three array so that you have only one ace along any row or column, you have only one diamond along any row and column, and so on? That is, you have only a unique type of card and value of card along any row and column. It is possible. Indeed, it's possible. And uh, if you have nine, it is possible. And this is an arrangement which is showing that. Okay. From this, you can construct an absolutely maximally entangled state of three levels, or what is called Q-trits, in the following way. Let this A's be one, King be two, Queen be three, and this Diamond be one, etc. Okay. So here, I've just transformed these to numbers, that's all. So you can see that the first column does not repeat, one, three, two, one, two, three. So the blacks don't repeat along column or row. Blues don't repeat along column or row. Such a unique configuration is called an orthogonal Latin square. So it's called a pair of orthogonal Latin squares or OLS. And the black ones here, just each of these things contain what's called a Latin square. A Latin square is just an array of D elements in a D by D array such that no repetition along row or column. And there are two such Latin squares and we are having a union of those two and all the D square pairs are present. That's called an orthogonal Latin square of dimension D. This implies a maximally entangled state of four parties, of four parties in the following way. We take this element here and we call that one, one because this is the address of this array. So that's the row and column is one, one. This address is the first row, a second row, first column. So that will be two, one. So two, one, three, two. 
Okay. Uh, 3, 2, 3, 1. That will correspond to this. Third row, second column, 3, 1. So now you have constructed now a quantum state by superposing this from this orthogonal Latin square. And very interestingly, from the fact that this is an orthogonal Latin square, you can show that this is an absolutely maximally entangled state of four particles of four atoms with three levels in each. Okay, so you can have uh, you can have in all three power. Uh, so, so this is an absolutely maximally entangled state, and you can construct this using these orthogonal Latin squares. Do there exist orthogonal Latin squares in any dimension D? This is an interesting question that was answered by Euler to some extent many years ago. And he said, well, it's very easy to see that they don't exist for two by two. I'm going to leave that as an exercise to you. Okay, three by three here is an example. In fact, for all odd numbers, you can construct easily. Euler went ahead and constructed for all multiples of four. What was left was numbers which are of the, of the form 2 plus 4k, like 2, 6, 10, and so on. To cut a long story short, actually, there was, there were, it, it remained an open problem. People tried to prove it. They were not successful. It was proved about in 1900 that OLS of order 6 also do not exist. Okay? That's a very important thing for us. OLS of order 6 do not exist. But people thought that OLS of 10 and 20, uh, 14 and so on does not exist. This was proven by two Indian mathematicians. They constructed first around 1960 an order 22 OLS that exists. And then they proved along with, uh, 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 along with a uh, uh, colleague from the U.S. that in fact it exists for all dimensions except 2 and 6. Okay, these orthogonal Latin squares exist for all dimensions except two and six. So, uh, what is the quantum problem, corresponding quantum problem? Actually, it may be difficult for me to explain in detail, but let me just tell you that there is a quantum equivalent of these kind of orthogonal Latin squares when we try to go from these lead to, these orthogonal Latin squares lead to permutation matrices. That's easy to see. Let's take this entry 1, 1. We put it in, you, you make a 9 by 9 matrix of zeros and 1s. You block it into 3 by 3 matrices, okay? In the first 3 by 3 block, at position 1, 1, you put, the, uh, you put wherever this number is here, you put a 1 there. So there is 1, 1, you put a 1, 2, 2, you put a 2 there. The third block, in this block, 1, 3. Okay, and so on. So you get a permutation matrix, which means that it's a matrix of ones and zeros with only one one in each row and column. What makes this an OLS is that there are two further permutations of the entries of this such that the matrix still remains permutation. So this is a magical thing which I don't have time to explain, but there are just rearrangements of these. One is called partial transpose in which you take each of these blocks and you transpose within these blocks, okay? And for example, here, this one goes there. It should still remain a permutation matrix. And a realignment, which is an aspect of taking this block and making it into a column, into a row. Each of the blocks, you make it into a row vector, okay? It should still remain this. So, this happens if the thing is an OLS. So what is, but the question that remained was that, yes, an OLS of order six does not exist, but maybe there exists absolutely maximally entangled states of four parties of six di dimensions each. That might still exist. Although this T, I, J, K, L, these coefficients here are not permutations, but they can be unitary operators. So we, extend from this permutations to unitary operators, and then we ask the question which is that exists. It's known that for qubits or for level two, this is not the case, it does not exist. So this was an open problem for a long time. There were some awards given to it and so on. And we recently showed that actually it does exist and happily enough. 
So here is an example of a Latin square in six by six, an attempt at getting an orthogonal Latin square. Okay, you can see that there are now six types of cards or six values and six types. Okay, this looks like non-repeating, non-repeating, etc. In fact, if you look at along any row and column, it looks like non-repeating. So it looks like it contradicts Euler's thing, but now you see the shaded regions, they repeat. So not all 36 possibilities are there okay, because of this repetition. So there is no orthogonal Latin square of this. So we make use of these things and in effect, we create some superpositions so that of such, uh, uh, such approximate orthogonal Latin squares, such that we can create exactly an unitary operator which remains unitary under this realignment and partial transpose. So that's what we are doing. And this was a difficult problem for a long time. Uh, people didn't know that, but we effectively found the solution here of what is called the 36 officer problem of Euler. And uh, the quantum problem has the solutions of these coefficients, which is written down explicitly in terms of this ABC complex numbers. Actually, they, these ABCs are real numbers here. And interestingly, the ratios are the golden mean. And there is this omega, which is a root of unity, which I don't seem to have uh, written here, but it's a 20th root of unity. So there are these peculiar numbers which enter here, uh, the golden mean and this root of unity to construct this quantum problem so solution to a classically impossible problem. So this is actually a representation of that in which we are superposing these kind of uh, uh, states or these kind of Latin, nearly near Latin squares to create a quantum orthogonal Latin square that is perfect. So this paper has appeared, I mean, it's to appear to be published recently, but those who are interested can look in the archive. It's called 36 Entangled Officers of Euler Quantum Solution to Classically Impossible Problem. This is a PhD student who played a very important role in this, Suhail Ahmadrada. These other three students, Adam, Wojtek, Rigosh, are students of my longtime colleague, I mean, co collaborator, Karol Szyszkowski from the Jagiellonian University. Poland, Krakow. Okay, so I'm sorry about the, as usual, being a bit above time, but it's a long journey uh, from classical chaos to this. So this has gotten, if you're interested, there is a lot of uh, write-ups now in the public, uh, or in the popular media. There's an article in Quanta magazine, for example, Euler's 243-year-old impossible puzzle gets a quantum solution and so on and so forth. So you can read some of those articles and uh, hopefully you will enjoy it. So I will, it's now 15 minutes past six o'clock. So I thank you all again and apologize for going over time. Anything? I will now continue. Thank you. All. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was very enlightening talk. We have a few questions from the YouTube chat. Should I bring them up one by one? Yes, please. So, sir, there is one question. What's the best way to deal with turbulence? Is it classical mechanics chaos or quantum chaos? It appears like in turbulence, we have a generation and redistribution like quantum entanglement as discussed in the lecture. It's a complex and interesting question. I think the question was about turbulence, um, which is um, uh, still a classical, well, it's considered to be a classical open problem. The difference between that and what I've talked about, is, first of all, turbulence is a many body uh, phenomenon, and uh, it also involves critically viscosity or, or dissipation. Okay, so it's driven turbulence that is usually uh, uh, studied, where you're uh, the undriven uh, turbulence, which comes from the Euler equation, is still not really fully understood. Again, Euler comes in here, very different way. Uh, but also, interestingly, I mean, so the roots to turbulence, initially when people started studying chaos, they were excited about it. They thought it would solve the problem of turbulence. And it does solve, in some sense, what is called onset of turbulence. In fact, some of the 
uh, uh, well-known results from early theories of uh, uh, universality in classical chaos were tested experimentally in onset of turbulence, such as the rayleigh bernard convection. But um, I don't think that it has a quantum origin. But nevertheless, the study of quantum turbulence is something which is on. People study uh, uh, liquid helium and, and, and so on. And it's, it's a very interesting uh, subject of which I'm not uh, very familiar. Uh, uh, and I, if you talk about entanglement and so on in these systems, I have absolutely no clue about. But I think that these are uh, interesting questions for you to answer. Uh, there's another question. What are your thoughts about breaking of casualty in delayed choice quantum eraser experiment? Breaking of, sorry? Breaking of casualties uh, oh, in what? delayed choice. Causality? Sorry, causality. Yeah. Breaking of causality in? Delayed choice quantum eraser experiment. Okay. Uh, well, Causality is a basic uh, basic principle. In fact, you can use that to build. Uh, people have tried to use that as a building block to construct quantum theory out of that. You use a few of the uh, few things which you think are essential. So causality is, in fact, one of these things. The delayed choice experiment uh, illustrates entanglement uh, in a in a very interesting way uh, but otherwise I don't think that there is any uh, uh, um, any uh, further uh, you know uh, breaking of causality because that would mean an interchange of cause and effect I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, sir, there's another question. Are there any hidden variable theories for classical chaos? For classical chaos? It's a good question again. So now, what is a hidden variable theory? For those of you who are, for whom this hidden variable theory is hidden, in fact, uh, that is what Bell was trying to do. Uh, in fact, you can see that here, that Bob simultaneously measures in the direction. In a hidden variable theory, the measurement results are predetermined. The hidden variables might decree, for example, that Alice measures a spin up, Bob will measure his down. That is, hidden variables are extra variables which one puts in a state. So this is what, uh, in a sense, Bohm tried to do and uh, maybe Einstein visualized that quantum mechanics is incomplete. There is some further degrees of freedom which we don't know, which we are not measuring. And that, because we don't know that it is appearing uh, to us as random. Okay. What John Bell did was very uh, interesting. He said, let's take the most general hidden variable theory possible. Okay. Any number of parameters, but it is a classical hidden variable theory. And then you try to construct these correlations. In fact, that is precisely how Bell's inequality was found. By uh, So Bell's inequality rules out any hidden variable theory in, in if there is a violation of Bell's inequality. So in fact, violation of Bell's inequality means that there is no hidden variable theory for that, uh, for that state. For a single qubit, you can construct hidden variable theories that was done by John Bell himself. For two and above, you don't. So the uh, so it's a more complex question in the sense of quant classical chaos is just an aspect of dynamics. So, in fact, I told you that classical chaos or chaos when quantized leads to greater entanglement. So actually, I would say it goes the opposite way. Classical chaos would would there will be a breakdown of any hidden variable theory you may have of a state because it gets more and more non-local and more and more entangled. It may sound counterintuitive to you. In fact, a lot of people would say that, well, this chaos cannot be compatible with entanglement. 
but that's a story for another day we are looking at a closed system in which you have chaos as a whole this can lead to high amount of non locality entanglement and so on so i would say that actually you have less likelihood of finding uh, uh, hidden variable theories for states which are generated from classical chaos or just from quantum chaos i should say yeah but it's a good question and yeah nidhi uh, sir there's a question can emergent phenomena such as synchronization of coupled systems be considered as classical analog or limit of quantum entanglement a very interesting question i don't know the answer okay um so uh well all of classical mechanics not just synchronization is an emergent phenomenon so um uh, synchronization would be one of the uh let's say remarkable phenomena which comes out of that that being said there are also ongoing current studies about quantum synchronization synchronization is something where you have many systems which are you know they start out with very different states they can be even chaotic individually but because of the interactions they all tend to synchronize and they all move pretty much in the same way although they may each be chaotic okay so this is the possible chaotic synchronization but one of the key things which is essential is dissipation and we are talking about quantum chaos i have not talked about open systems at all but when you talk about open systems there is loss of information and so on quantum synchronization is something which is being discussed in today's uh, research literature so it may be interesting to phrase that question in these kind of systems where you already have some quantum synchronization and you go to a classical limit what happens to that so uh, there is a question the particles need to interact or share proximity in order to get entangled doesn't that imply that the outcomes are predetermined even if they appear random say the uh, could, could you read the question again please yes, sir the particles need to interact or share proximity in order to get entangled doesn't that imply that the outcomes are predetermined even if they appear random must be deterministic is that what they are saying uh, by determined uh, i'm i'm not sure why that is the case of course yes so first of all the first part of your question you need interaction to have entanglement there is another scenario where you don't need entanglement i mean interaction to have entanglement that comes in to play when you have uh, identical particles electrons photons they're all identical particles they are bosons bosons or fermions they have symmetric uh, for example up down minus down up okay so this is a, a, this is coming from anti symmetric anti symmetrization so you could also have entanglement from that but even the most common uh, situation is when you have some interaction and then it's creating uh, entanglement but why should that be deterministic is not clear to me at all there is no connection between the two the non determinism comes from quantum measurement which doesn't have even to do with entanglement even unentangled uh, uh, single particle uh, systems have uh, de non determinism built into it due to quantum measurements collapsing it into many possible states of the observable uh observable so there are certain states of the observable the eigen states into which it can collapse so that's i think unrelated if i understood the question correctly so uh, these were the questions um Okay, very good. Uh, so, if there are no further questions, do we close it, or do we still open it for? Uh, Probably not, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. We are about to close. Okay, very good. Thank you, Thank sir, you. for your valuable time and the interesting, intriguing talk. Uh, Thank you, and thank you for the invitation again. Yes, Bye, everyone. Thank you sir. Yes.
Thanks, Vidhi. I need to stop sharing.